part six. I'll pray. We'll begin. Our Father in heaven, help. Please ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Old Testament is full of prophecies. The New Testament is full of prophets building on the prophecies of the Old Testament and the New. And often the New Testament prophets built in surprising ways. That's our class today. Now, you should make it a, I, this is not, I don't really have a, a, a divine inspired statement, but common sense tells you this. You should only talk about what you know about. Because <laughs> if you talk about what, you, you sound like a fool for one thing. And number two, it brings in confusion and opens the door for conjecture and guesswork. So you, got, you ought to know what you're talking about. Now, Sister Lee, you want to read that nice little statement? Mm -hmm. The people of God will be called upon to stand before kings, princes, rulers, and great men of the earth, and they must know that they do know what is true. Yeah, they were astonished at his doctrine, Luke four thirty two, because his word was with power. power. He only talked about he talked about what he knew about. What did he know about? Everything. <laughs> so, anything he talked about, he knew what he was talking about. And I spent four years in that place, not as a prisoner. I was in jail in a different jail. I was there as the preacher. For four years, I was the preacher in the Dade County Jail. I won't tell you how I got in that position. It's not, it's, it's a long story. But I didn't, I just got to Wildwood Hospital, didn't know anything. I mean, hardly even knew anything. anything. I mean, I couldn't even find genocide. I didn't know there was I had nothing. And a guy that got providentially put in contact with, his name is W.D. Frizee. I said, Elder Z, I, I, I'm, I'm going to do the jail ministry starting this week, and I don't know anything. And he's spelling it out. So he said, do you know even one thing? He said, be serious. I said, well, yeah, I know one verse. He said, that's all you need. <laughs> Go and tell them what you know. And then during the next week, what? Share with them whatever you know. Yeah, you learn something new. Mm -hmm. Then now you got two. You go back. And then the next week, mm -hmm. three. And then you go back. He said, all you need is one. One will do it. One will do the trick. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's just one will do. Can, you, can a man be saved by one verse? The just shall live by faith. A man can be saved by one verse. But you ought to know at least one before you start. If you don't know anything, keep your mouth. Isn't that good advice? Okay, now we're ready. When the New Testament uses the Old Testament. Uh, what happens, the Old Testament prophecies, and you know, interrupt me, if what, if what I'm saying doesn't make perfect sense, interrupt me. The Old Testament prophets would write, and then the New Testament prophets often would take that and apply it to, present. give me a name though, to the present, apply it to whom? Uh, the Lamb of God. Who is that? Oh, Slain from the foundation of the world. Who is that? The Passover lamb, 1 Corinthians 5, 7. Who is that? They take these things and apply it to all this is Christ. So I want to take one to begin with. Our class today is... In Exodus 12, you have the killing of the Passover lamb. Leviticus 23 is the feast that celebrates it. But Exodus 12 is the event you put it up for a few days, you kill it on a certain day, you do this, you strike the, you know, the blood, and you do this, and you do that, and you do this, and you do that. But now, once the blood's on the door, and you're in the house, you're supposed to eat what? In the house. Eat what in the house? In the house. You do it in the house. You eat what you killed, the Passover lamb. lamb. And then as you eat the Passover lamb, be careful that you 1246 of Exodus don't do what? Now, if you're sitting back there listening to Moses recount these things as he writes it down, and then you read it, you're Jeremiah reading books of Moses, there's no way on earth you would see that as a prophecy, is there? No way on earth. Was it a prophecy? Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. So John, yeah, John took, say, say it again. I said David spoke about it, not one bone shall be Yeah. But New Testament... John took it and said, this is a prophecy. Now, the, per the bigger picture today, 
Why in the world did God put so many prophecies in so many places? That's the question we're going to look at. Who read uh, now Sister Taylor 33 and 34 of John? When they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. Now that retains the meaning and the intent of the Old Testament. Now pause. Why did the soldiers not break his leg? Okay, well, all right, but they didn't know anything about the prophecy. Why did they not break his leg? Because he was dead. He was already dead. Now, the thief on the right and the thief on the left, they what? Broke their legs. Because those men were alive. But six hours after he was hung on the cross, Mark 15, six hours after he was hung on the cross, he's what? No need to break his legs. Is that a fulfillment of Exodus 12, 30, 12 46? Yes. yes. Well, I'll tell you what, John said it was. And then he tells you why it was. Now, it's the bigger picture. It's the bigger picture. I wrote that. <laughs> Reasons to believe. No, I didn't. John did. There it is. Uh, Bible's full of examples, full of prophecies, full of things. John said it. John said, please see the bigger picture. And he who had been, who has seen him, and he who has seen his has testified and his testimony is true and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. Believe what? For these things were done that the this is coming right after they broke his, didn't break his legs. That were done that the scripture should be fulfilled not one of his bones should be broken. And again another scripture says they shall look on him whom they pierced. Do you see it in verse 35? so that you may believe. That's why I put it in there. All these prophecies, all these fulfillments, it is I sit here in Iron City reading them, that I'll believe it. Now, go back to Exodus 4. Who will read uh, Sister, uh, Sister Nicole? And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, okay. even thy firstborn. And it came to pass by the way in the end that the Lord that the Lord meet. Look at that, that well, that's it. <laughs> you don't, don't worry about the rest. <laughs> now, I'll ask a bunch of questions. When God delivered His Son out of His what? When God delivered His people out of Egypt, He referred to them as His what? His Are you sure? Are you sure? Yes. I am too. And then He told Pharaoh, if you don't let God's Son go, God's going to kill, kill your son. This is, this is the deal. Right? Now, reading that, who would ever see that as a prophecy? You can't. It's impossible. When Hosea picked up the pen, right, and Hosea is looking at Exodus 4 and commenting on it, what does Hosea say? Going over the same ground as Exodus 4. Who read it? Israel was a child, then I loved him and called my son out of Egypt. Talking about who? Hosea is writing about the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Now Matthew picks up the pen, filled up with the Holy Ghost, and everything changes. It is a completely different application, completely different. Mm -hmm. There's no semblance. It's just completely different. And then the big question, Hosea wrote, applied, what Matthew reapplied. Subject this morning, application and reapplication. And when they were departed, behold, oh, this is so good. I love this kind of thing. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to jo Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise and take your young child and his mother. Go where? To Egypt, right? That's a safe place. Run down to Egypt, hide for a while. Verse 14, Sister Renee, you want to read just verse 14? When he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and then departed to Egypt. Joseph and Mary and uh, the baby lived where? In Egypt. Egypt. And was there until the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled which the Lord, spoken by the Lord by the prophet, saying, That is a different application. Total, thank you. Totally different. Ho Holy Ghost, right through uh, Moses. Holy Ghost, right through Isaiah. Same Holy Ghost, right through Matthew. And we, we, we should expect to see the same thing. In the Absolutely. Episode. That's why it's so important to, you know, know, because Christ, there are so many scriptures in the Bible that uh -huh, yeah. but the yeah. Christ hollows all of them. Sure. 
yeah. called Cyrus's son. Yeah. But later on, he talks about him, um, Cyrus, taking the people out of Babylon and um, the, those that were pressed. But it points to Jesus Christ. Absolutely. As well. There, there, there are a dozen things in there. When Jesus comes, he's coming as the king of the what? East after what plague? The drying yeah. up of the the the, 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 the so you're afraid of, yeah. Forty four and forty five Isaiah Revelation. It's just all. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. You know, the the point you showed before when it says and their eyes well I'm, I'm paraphrasing um, their eyes looked upon uh, him whom they pierced. Yeah. They saw him at the but at the end yeah. their eyes will see him again. Yeah. Whom they are pierced but this time without mocking. Yeah, no mocking, no fear. Now, so here's a question. If the Holy Ghost says this means this, I accept it. How about you? Yes. Are you sure? <laughs> All right. Now, uh, interesting uh, application of this. You think about Paul and you think about Isaiah. Isaiah, here am I what? Send me. Paul said what? What would thou have me to do? Well, same thing, except now it ain't Isaiah and it ain't Paul. It's Jesus using those words back at us. That's a complete reversal of what you read in Isaiah 9 and, and, and Acts. It's complete reverse 6 in, in Acts. It's complete reversal. Uh, Sister Barbara, you want to read? If you will call, the Lord will answer you. He will say, here I am. What would you have me do for you? No question. Somebody says, here am I. What would I have me to do for you? Who's speaking? Well, it's us and Isaiah 6 and Acts verse 9. But in this statement, it's who? It's God. If you will call, the Lord will answer and say what? It's the Lord speaking. That's a completely different application. That's a broader meaning. Aren't you glad the Lord talks like that? <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? Oh, the next one. Uh, 13, uh, 45, and 46 in the King James is a little different. A merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he found a one pearl great price, this is a different version, sold all that he had. That's, that's King James 46. This is a different version. I like this version for what we're studying this morning. Uh, this one, I don't know what it is. I don't know which version it is. But Brother R, and you want to read? Then after he reads, according to this, you tell me who the pearl of great price is. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Who's the pearl of great price? Ah, somebody's looking for goodly pearls. And when they found one pearl of great price, they sold what? everything to buy it. Who's the pearl? Jesus. Of course it's Christ. Since, since Barbara, since you said that, why don't you read? Christ himself is the pearl of great price. Price, I'm sorry. The parable of the costly pearl. Now, one reason, and there are many, I'm, not, I'm not in the mind of God. Let me tell you what's in the mind of God. That's ridiculous. One reason that he does it. Just one reason. When you sell everything you have to get the pearl of great price, did you get more than what you gave up? Yes. Are you sure? Mm -hmm. Because if you did not, then... It won't be. Yeah, why do it? You wouldn't do that. Again, my... The value is great that you would sell. I'd have to get some more value. Yeah. Again, my example. Who's got the worst car around? Who's got the most beat up car around here? <laughs> I don't know. Who's got the most beat-up car? Anybody have a beat-up car? Who sent who? I don't have one. Okay, you don't have one. You're not working? That's a beat-up car. If it doesn't work, it's beat-up. It may look good on the outside, but dead on the inside. Your car does not work. If I'm driving a Mercedes to trade her my Mercedes for a dead car makes no sense. I've got to believe that what I'm getting is greater than what I'm giving up. Isn't that true? Yeah. Makes no sense. So when you give up everything for God, you believe, well, what you're getting is more than what you're giving up. If you hold on, then you believe what you have is worth more than what you're going to get. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And then God fills somebody with the Holy Ghost, our high calling. Mm -hmm. The Lord God of heaven collected all the riches of the universe. This is the opposite of Matthew 13, 46. And laid them down in order to purchase the pearl of two questions. Does God know value? He does. 
So when he gave up everything in the universe, I don't want to say me, I just can't even bring myself to say that. Let's say uh, whoever over here, did he get more than he gave up? Are you calling him a fool? He's a, he knows value. He gave his life for you. Did he get more than he gave up? Oh yes. You are worth more than the life of the Son of God. That's one reason why, that's, that's why he flips it. That's why he keeps flipping these things, to try to encourage us to believe. The Lord God of heaven collected all the riches of the universe, 832 of Romans. He spared not his own son, right? He rolled it all out and laid them down in order to purchase Arian. I mean, is he worth it? Come on. Or did God make a bum deal? What? Yeah, when God when God gave it all for Ryan, did he get more than he gave up? He sure. <laughs> should. People are stumbling now. No, no, that's what it says. Let's do it again. Because you got half people there. Their, their face is twisted into a question mark. <laughs> the Lord God of heaven collected all the riches of the universe and laid them down in order to purchase the pearl of lost humanity. Either God's a fool or he knows value. To think about that. Um, as we were talking about the verse that says, you know, that they might believe, like, to think about that really does something to your heart to see the love of God, which should cause you. Should do. cause you. Yeah. That's one reason that he flips these prophecies. I like to study five or six. And there may be 5,000, 5 million, I don't know. Now, it's flipped again. <laughs> it's the same thing. Not applied that way, not applied that way, applied a third way. In the parable, in the parable, in the parable, a <laughs> parable of a parable. In the parable, the pearl is not represented as a gift. The merchant bought it at the price of all that he had. Many to question the meaning of all this. Some of you do, I bet. Since Christ is represented in the scriptures as a gift. Now, wait a minute. It's a gift. No, it's not a gift. It's a gift. It's not a gift. Ryan, you read the rest? He is a gift. <laughs> but only to those who give them, themselves soul, body, and spirit to Him without reserve. When we thus give ourselves wholly to Him, Christ, with all the treasures of Him, gives Himself to us. We obtain the pearl of great price. This is about the only time I know when you got to go first. First John 4, 19, I love him because he first, first loved me. Christ came down to the earth, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, come unto me. He, this time you got to go first. You've got it all, but you got to give all to get all. When we thus give ourselves wholly to him, what, how do you do that? Easy. Lord, I'm yours. It's that simple. With all the treasures of heaven, gives himself to us. Now, before I knew Seven Day Adventists, I'd never been to church, never, hardly ever prayed. I, I was reading the Bible. I was still drinking, reading the Bible. Now, I was not drunk this day. I was looked at the Bible. I was laying there in the bed, going to bed, stone sober, wide awake, heard a voice. I've heard it twice in my life. That's the first time. Just started reading the Bible. I heard a voice in English speaking from the sky. It said, Christ is a measuring line. Boom, period. Christ is a measuring line. Okay. You measure yourself against not. Yeah. And then uh, you say that was from the devil, that's okay. Whatever you want to say, that's fine. You say I was uh, hallucinating, uh, no, I wasn't. <laughs> so then I heard second time. Second time, my mother remarried a man named Alvin. Couldn't stand the guy. He was obnoxious. He'd write down in a little book. If you did him wrong, he'd write it down and remind you of it. Mm. Tough guy. But now I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Got baptized. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist now. And I look at Alvin, can't stand the guy. And I'm sitting there, you know, reading the Bible. <laughs> I know I'm wrong. And then uh, I was praying about Alvin. The second and the last time I ever heard a voice. This is just as I met Seventh-day Adventist. And this is a quote. You'd be the judge of where it came from. The person you like least, and came to my mind, who? Oh, Alvin. Alvin. The person you like least is of more value than anything in this universe. Mm -hmm. 
period. That's the only time I ever heard. That was it. Never heard a voice again. I thought, Alvin. And as I thought about that, in my mind, this is what I saw, the scale. On this side, Alvin. On this side, everything else. Home, Alvin. Can that be true? This is, again, one of my favorites. James 1 5. Any man lack, lack wisdom, I'm asking of God. I used to do this. I used to say, Ask of God who giveth all men liberally, and it breaketh not, and it what? Shall be given. It's going to be given. All right, Lord, you're going to give it to me. You're going to give it to me. Oh, dear friends, reapplication. No, he's not. <laughs> you got to read it again. You got to read it on the third time around, right? The Lord has reapplied it. He does not promise you wisdom for. Today. today. Okay. For yourself today. Now, yeah, you got, no, yeah, yeah. Reapplied. I read this thing, I thought, ah, now it all makes sense. <laughs> it's a rephrasing of James 1 5. Uh, 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 Brother Ryan, read. The strength and wisdom imparted are for the present emergence. If any of you lack wisdom. And I didn't know, I didn't change anything. This is how it reads. There's dashes and for today. For today. <laughs> Let him ask of God, and give it to all men in the room, and then bring it not, and it shall be given. Wisdom promise, I'm sorry, wisdom you need tomorrow is not promised for you today, right? In other words, we're getting some prophetic clarification, right? I don't know what I'm going to do when I finish school. Dear friends, you don't need to know. <laughs> and when you need to know, come on. You will let you know. Let you know. <laughs> is the evil thereof? I got all the problems I need today. The Lord said, I'm not going to, I'm not going to saddle you with anything else. You know, and that, that helped me. Did it help you? I said, all right. I keep asking for wisdom. Don't seem to get any. You don't need it yet. When you need to know what to say, you're brought before the judgment hall and the kings and the presidents, then you'll know. Today? It's like Solomon. You know, it's like Solomon. When he had the wisdom, but yeah. he went to apply it. God gave it to him. Give it to him, right? Yeah, same with us. Same with us. Now, another angle. Seven letters of Revelation. Now, it says, excuse me, I'm about to hiccup. <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in Revelation, it tells you the panoramic view of the seven churches from the apostolic church to the second coming is represented in these seven letters. Where does it say that? Right there. Sister Lee, you want to read? This is John writing, prophetic writing. Write down what you have seen, both the things that are now happening and the things that will happen. Yeah, uh, the things which are and the things which are hereafter. That's the King James. Same thing, right? Same, the things that shall be thereafter. So when you read it, 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 it tells you how it is now, but it also tells you how it will be. Were there really seven last churches? Sardis, Ephesus, were there really seven last churches? Were those really seven letters? But did they have more of a prophetic meaning too? Those churches pointed forward. And today we say as the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we're who? Laodicea. So that letter, Laodicea, the seventh church, was written to us. Well, Jane? She said all of this is for us. Ah, that's us now. But before she came along, nobody said that. You read it, seven churches. Now, the one before us, James White, was in that church, Philadelphia, Revelation 3 7. This is Philadelphia. Sardis, the one before Philadelphia, Revelation 3 1. Name be live, but you're dead. You got seven churches. I'm now. Oh, I'm glad I wasn't a member of Sardis. <laughs> they got a name that they live, but they're what? Glad I wasn't a member of Sardis. The names of the seven churches are, that nails it down, right? Seven periods, prophetic segments of the Christian church from apostolic times to the second coming. The bottom part, while the symbols used reveal the conditions of the church at different times in the history of the world. So you got Ephesus to Laodicea. The panoramic perspective of the Christian church in this development. Glad I wasn't in Sardis. <laughs> they were dead. <laughs> Walking zombies. Who'd like to read verse 1? Now, is that spiritual or physical? Spiritual. spiritual. Are they in rough spiritual shape? Mm -hmm. I'm glad they're not writing about me. <laughs> Aren't you? No. Now, verse 2, Sister Taylor, yeah. <laughs> Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain. 
that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Now, now here's a little sliver of good news in verse 3, says Taylor. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. And therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Now again, the verse numbers don't appear in the Bible. Verse 4 goes with that. Thou hast a few names, even as artists, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in light, for they are worthy. What's that got to do with me? I'm a Laodicean. Uh, nothing to brag about, right? <laughs> now you read this thing and all of a sudden, hmm, hmm. A few faithful ones in? Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. Yeah, friends, uh, this is about Sardis. Uh, it's also about Seventh-day Adventist Church. I'll read the first part. The church of Sardis is represented as... Now, you've got to read this one carefully is represented as having in it a few faithful ones among the many who had become, as it were, careless and insensible of their obligations to God. Thou hast a few names, even a Sardis, which thou hast not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Okay, so far so good. Who is so favored as to be numbered among these few in Sardis? Well, I don't know. And then she says, Are you? What you mean am I? That was Sardis. Am I? What you mean you? That was Sardis. Who are among this number? It is not best for us to inquire into this matter in order that we may learn to whom the Lord refers when He says that a few have not stained their white robes of character. Who is He referring to? Sardis is the wrong church. Sister Nicole. In the message, church of Sardis, two parties are presented, those who have a name to live but are dead, and those who are striving to overcome. Study this message found in the third chapter of Revelation. Um, who are meant by those that are ready to die, and what has made them thus? The explanation is given, I have not found thy works perfect before God. If you've been sleeping until now, somebody hit your neighbor, wake him up. This next sentence you don't want to miss. To the church of the present day, this message is sent. Case closed. Mm -hmm. Yep, you live, but you're what? Dead. Mm -hmm. Not me. Not Lou Keith. No, no, no. <laughs> I'm alive. I'm alive. I'm alive. Going to the rice box. I'm going to get some pizza heavy on olive oil. I'm alive. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> the call upon our church members to read the whole of the third chapter of Revelation. And to make an application. Oh, no, 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 I'll keep going. To make an application what? Of it. The message to the church of the Laodiceans applies especially to the people of God today. It is a message to professing Christians who have become so much like the world that no difference can be seen. Now, in the sequence of history, we're the last church, but we're in the same sad shape as ours. Mm -hmm. Nothing new. <laughs> not me, not me, not yes, you. Oh no, it can't be. I have words to speak to my brethren, east and west, north and south. That includes who? Oh, I live on the North Pole. Don't worry, it's you're up north. <laughs> I request that my writing shall not be used as a leading argument to settle questions over which there is now so much controversy. Ah, this is the hard part. I entreat elders H, I, and J. I could tell you the H, I, and J are, but it's all of them. Willie White, A, G, Dan, all these guys. They're, they're in a heated argument over the daily. Mm -hmm. This time it's the daily. There are other things in different times. Only talk about what you yeah. know. Because when you talk about what you don't know, yeah. you're talking about what you yeah. don't know. That's a private mm -hmm. interpretation. Elders H, I, and J, and others of our leading brethren, that they have make they make no reference to my writings to sustain their views of the daily. Don't say E. G. White said this, E. G. White said that, because she's about to say E. G. White does not know what it means. And the thing is, they would not shut up. They kept going. <laughs> Which tells you what they despise the prophet. Because when she spoke, mm -mm, don't hear that, don't hear that. I'm not an artist, can't hear that. I'm going to the Pizza Hut. <laughs> it has been presented to me that this is not a subject of vital importance. I am instructed that our brethren are making a mistake 
and magnifying the importance of the difference in the views that are held. I cannot consent that any of my writings shall be taken as settling this matter. Ah, the true meaning of the daily is not to be made a test question. I now ask that my ministering brethren shall not make use of my writings in their arguments regarding this question. Okay, Sister Leah, where I've underlined. For I have had no instruction on the point under discussion, and I see no need for the controversy. Regarding this matter under present conditions, silence is eloquence. I have no instruction on the point under discussion. If she had no instruction, how can you pull her writings out to prove what you believe? You can't. Evidently, there were some on both sides. They were shaking E.G. White's writings, and they were shaking E.G. White's writings. And Mrs. White was shaking her writings. Shut up! <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> the enemy of our work... <clears throat> Uh, can I sum that up by saying the Holy Spirit puts an end to discussion sometimes, right? Yes. The enemy of our work is pleased when a subject of minor importance. Can you name um, something of minor importance? I'll give you 50. No, I don't have time for that. I'll give you one or two or three. Should a man shave on the Sabbath? Who cares? Mm -hmm. I've seen people almost not, not quite come to blows arguing about should a man shave on the Sabbath? Really? Mm hmm you go down my list? Is it okay to wash dishes on the Sabbath? Now, you got your ideas on that. That's fine. You got your ideas. Keep it to yourself. Yeah, thank you. Keep it to yourself. When you have uh, the prophet's idea, then you let me know what it is. Take a shower on the Sabbath. Thank you. You're, you're a step ahead of me. Take a shower on the Sabbath. And then, uh, you know, you got all these things. That's just one little area. And then you got beef. <laughs> You know, the controversy over that. The health message is this big. No, no, really. The health message is this big. Meat eating is one small part. And we can't even get that right. <laughs> and just uh, everything, yeah. Uh, importance can be used to divert, divert the minds of our brethren from the great questions that should be the burden of our message. As this is not a test question, I entreat my brethren, they shall not allow the enemy to triumph by having it treated as such. And so I kind of kind of say the one for the end that was, to me, the most interesting. In the 1880s, a controversy developed over the subject of the law in Galatians. Because the law is a schoolmaster, right? It's a school teacher to bring us to Christ. The question that arose is 8 of 324 of Galatians. The question that arose is, is that the ceremonial law or the moral law of Ten Commandments? It's both. Okay. Wherefore, there's the verse in, in controversy. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. But it's that second part, that we might be justified by faith. I'm going to need an arbiter here for this. <laughs> I mean, who am I going to find? Well, last day prophet. Mm -hmm. Now, this one we'll, we'll read slowly. When she says, I say through the word given me, what's that mean? It's not hers. It's not hers. That's all it means. It's God speaking through flesh, right? Mm -hmm. Through clay. Those who have stood so firmly to defend their ideas and positions on the law in Galatians have need to search their hearts as with a lighted candle to see what manner of spirit has actuated them. Mm -hmm. And then she's about to, I'm going to paraphrase and then read it. It's worth saying twice. Basically, if your religion makes you one sour, unpleasant, mm -hmm. then why would I want that religion? If your position on Galatians makes you like that, mm -hmm. I don't want anything to do with Galatians. Mm -hmm. and that's the problem. This morning, was it, uh, I think it was in what Aisha read, the presentation has a large influence on the acceptance of the health message. Same is true in the Bible. Mm -hmm. I walked into Heritage Academy in 1994, 95, doing a week of prayer there. Came into the back door of the student cafeteria. I was at staff at Wildwood Hospital. I heard two students on the other side of the table. They said, 
There's that guy from Wildwood. <laughs> I thought their, their reputation has preceded them. <laughs> because you get a place with a flake or two, and the problem is, let's say you got one flake here. Somebody comes here, here's all this flaky stuff from one flake, goes back home, says flaky stuff. Where'd you get that stuff from? They don't say Joe, they say where? Butler Creek. And they think Butler Creek's a flaky place. Made a flaky place by what? One mouth. Yeah, is it, can one uh, cockroach spoil a whole bowl of soup? Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm glad there are no flakes around Butler Creek. Aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> What's in that freezer? Mm, close the door. <laughs> That's not a flake. A flake is you pull your whip out when other people stop eating ice cream too. <laughs> you know? All right. Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster. What kind of teacher are you anyway? I teach the law. Isaiah 58 verse 1. Cry out loud and I'm sparing nothing. To bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. Anyway, I saw through the word given me of God those who stand so firmly to defend their ideas and positions on the law of Galatians have need to search their hearts as with a lighted candle to see what the manner of spirit is actuated in. The problem is not Galatians, the problem is you and me. With Paul, I would say, yeah, Paul, I'll say along with Paul about you. Who bewitched you? You act like a man bewitched. Why? What are they doing with Galatians? They're fighting. The baseball bat says what on it? Galatians 3.24. <laughs> if you don't agree with me, I'm going to knock your teeth out. <laughs> <laughs> what satanic persistency and obstinacy has been evidenced? <laughs> a strong language. I've had no anxiety about the law in Galatians. <laughs> anxiety is about you, right? But I've had anxiety that our leading brethren should not go over the same ground of resistance to light and the manifest testimonies of the Spirit of God and reject everything to idolize their own supposed ideas and pet theories. Do you see the problem? I am forced by the attitude of my brethren have taken and the spirit evidence to say, God deliver me from Galatians. <laughs> the idea of Galatians that you put forth. Why? Ryan, read the rest. Go back to I am for I am forced. Back to I am forced. I am forced by the attitude my brethren have taken and the spirit evidence to say, God deliver me from your ideas of the, of the law in Galatians. If the receiving of these ideas make me so unchristian in my spirit, words and works as many who ought to know better than have been. Keep going. Better than have been. I see not the, the divine credentials accompanying you. I am warned again and again of what will be the result of this warfare you have persistently maintained against the truth. And you want to know that's interesting part? It's what, uh, it's what Ryan said before I started. He was three steps ahead of me again. That's okay. At the end of when it's all the smoke's cleared and everything, they were all wrong. No, every single one of them was wrong. They were all wrong. Not one was right. A point blank statement from God. The law, moral, or the ceremonial law in Galatians? Which one is it? Both. Both. You're all wrong. Can't take that. I know I'm not wrong. I know I'm not wrong. I know I'm not wrong. Sister wife, she had any hair left, we pulling it right out. No teeth, no hair. Just go <laughs> What's wrong with these pastors? They will not listen to God. They want ideas. I'm glad we're not like that. Yeah. Now. This sets the stage for January, February, March, and April. And then we finish the stage tomorrow. There are some questions that are of vital importance. The work the Lord has given to me at this time is to present to the people, by the word, it says the true testing questions, that's in, just like the messages. They title the section, the true testing questions. The work of that time the Lord has given us at this time is to present to the people 
the true light in regard to testing questions. Guess what they are? <laughs> Guess what they are? The law and the prophets. The blending of the human and the divine. You say, uh, what's that got to do with the photographer? Dear friends, if you focus on the photo, you miss the photographer. And the blending of the divine and the human in the ministry of Mrs. White teaches us how to reach that photographer. What do you mean? This is what I mean. On the left and then on the right. Uh, the left is a sign I got. I did not write on the left. But I've heard this a thousand times. Because a lot of the work I did was with non-Christians, non-Adventists, or Christians and not Adventists. They weren't Adventists. You work with Christians, you give them the health message, some say this. They use that verse, Luke 24, right? Give me a piece of fish. Did God eat fish? Yes. yes. Did God eat, eat meat as a man or as a God? Both. Both. Ask Abraham when he killed the cow. That was Jesus as God. He was not a man when he visited Abraham, going to Sodom to destroy it. He ate meat. Jesus was not a vegetarian. True or false? <laughs> He ate meat, he ate fish, he ate meat, he ate beef, cooked meat, cooked, you know, he cooked. he's a good cook too, cooked what fish? <laughs> now, Jesus was not a vegetarian, true or false? Sure. True, he wasn't a vegetarian, come on, don't you say he's a vegetarian? There's a verse, prove you wrong, don't you take the prophet over what you think? No, he was not a vegetarian. Let's try it again. Because I can't get to question B because you got to get question, past question A. Was G, <laughs> true or false? Was Jesus a vegetarian? He was. Right. Sure. He was, he was Jesus, all right. Jesus was not a vegetarian, true or false? True. No, oh, wait a minute here. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> all right, wait a minute. Sure. Let's change the question. Let's get what. Jesus ate meat, true or false? True. Sure. Jesus ate fish, true or false? True. Sure. Be careful. What's good enough for Jesus is good enough for me. No. False. <laughs> oh, yes. This is a big picture, you know. Thank you. That's where we started. The big picture. It's the big picture. Now, the man on the left saying that, you got to have divine wisdom in order to present this message. The what? Health message given what? By prophets. But you got to have the Spirit of God to, under, to understand how, to be, how He gives it. Because the presentation largely affects the reception. Okay, sister, somebody. <laughs> who, who read Re Ministry of Healing 314? Paragraph 3. In many places fish become so contaminated by the filth on which they feed as to be a cause of disease. And in the next paragraph, you know these statements. The next paragraph said the fish are swimming over there off the coast of Manila and they swim the clean waters, you catch them, you eat them, you still get the disease. So today the world is filthy, the, the oceans are polluted. And then the different things. Yeah, so it's uh, today, new light, right? New light. The test for you is not Luke 24. The test for me is ministry of healing. Now, if you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, the test for you is Luke 24. But today, only the Seventh-day Adventist church is the only church on earth with the blending of the human divine in one of their church members. Because if there is one, Mrs. Eddy, Christian scientist, uh, uh, was it Joseph Smith, Pearl of Great Price, the, uh, the, the false prophet, yeah, the, the, the Jehovah's Witness, they, do they have one? I know some of them. I don't think they're ones, right? We're the only one. Now, the charge Jesus laid on the Pharisees, you killed your own prophet. You killed your own. I sent a Jew to the Jews and you killed him. I sent a seven day Adventist to the seven day Adventist. This is our test. If we fail the test, can't do health evangelism. Because the test is the acceptance of the message that will win the world to the, to the church. 
Now, I'll, get, I'll give you an example. I think I've done it before. I'll do it again just because it was such a good one. I have three minutes left. It was such a good one to me. I was in Kingston, Jamaica doing lectures on diabetes and a young guy came. He looked something out like Sean, you know, kind of slick looking and everything. He was Jamaican, but slick looking. Sean looks slick, right? That's good. He, he can reach these slick people. <laughs> Guy came up to me after the lecture. He had mirror sunglasses on. I know if I repeat myself, that's okay. I'm an old man. I get it right. He had these mirror sunglasses. I looked at him. All I could see is myself. That just distracted me. <laughs> You're looking at yourself. But I don't want to say, would you take those sunglasses off? That might, that might hinder the gospel. So the guy, he, he comes up to me. Now, you tell me what you say. Careful. Kid gloves with God's people. Uh, he said, uh, you mentioned somewhere in there about alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he said, are you saying that you can't drink any alcohol at all? I looked at him. <laughs> I looked at myself, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and here's the question. I didn't say anything. Silence is <laughs> golden and alcohol. <laughs> then he said, all right, now you answer me. You answer. You're there in the park. Just met this guy, right? He's full of rastas around there, smoking dope. Ganja, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, listen here. I got one little cap full before I go to bed at night. You tell me I can't drink one cap full? What's your answer? What's your answer? Come on, what's your answer? Can I drink one cap full? It's a tough question, right? Is it a tough question? Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm sweating. <laughs> now, there's only one way to give this kind of message. you got to be filled with what? <laughs> and with? Love. Love. Law. Love. Plus the Holy Ghost. Plus, Love. God said, you're leaving that one out. Love equals? Oh, we got the message now. I told the guy, you know, I said, I said you know, brother, I said, you know, that's a hard question. You can see I was wrestling. It's a hard question. It's a hard answer for me to give. Ah, you know, that's a hard answer. <laughs> I didn't say I didn't answer him. I told him how hard the answer was. That's the end. He knows the answer, right? Mm -hmm. He knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We are, we, ye are the salt of the, we are light shining in a, sure dark place. Last but not least, if you read an early write, all those early books, all the early books. In 1844, now, real quick, 1844, did they understand the state of the dead? No. Sanctuary? Not a clue. Second coming? Not accurately. The Sabbath? No way. Mrs. White going to church on Sunday. They didn't understand anything. Health message? Jane Loughborough huffing a cigar. They didn't understand anything. <laughs> Eating pigs and smoking cigars. Didn't understand anything. By 1849, we had it all nailed down. Yeah. yeah the, breach was, the breach was getting closed up, wasn't it? They hadn't fully closed up yet. By 1849, we had it all nailed down. How do we get it? Don't you say Mrs. White. She was a part. They studied. They prayed. They could not understand. Boom, a vision. They could not agree. Boom, a vision. They hammered out the doctrines through Bible study. And when they got to a point where they say, I had a up all night, cannot figure it out. Spirit of God had come on Mrs. White. She said Hebrews 12, 1, 2, and 3. <laughs> Boom, there it is. And that's how we hammer the doctrines out through Bible study and encouragement and some direction from Mrs. White. If you want that, the, the verses, I'll give them to you tomorrow, the statements, read her book, early writings. First, select the messages, the last one for today. <sighs> Brother Aryan. Many of our people do not realize how firmly the foundation of our faith has been laid. Now, I believe Arian, the first book he read was The Great Controversy. Is it accurate? I think that's the first book. Is there some light in The Great Controversy? There's a whole lot of light, but there's not anything in there on diet. Right? There's not much in there on a lot of things, right? But there's a lot of things on the just shall live by faith. It's a good book you came to first. They're all good, though. You know, now since that time, yeah, he, he closed up The Great Controversy. Evidently, he believed it because he's sitting here. Now, it's the, the light shines more and more even unto the perfect day, Proverbs 4.18. Now, he goes to the next book. 
<laughs> right, the next book, right? What's the next book? Well, I don't know what the next book was. But then you read that one. Well, that's okay, I'll buy that. And then you come to the next, next book. And then I bought, first one for me was uh, first one for me was uh, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets. Mm, okay. Next one for me was I think Steps of Christ. Mm, okay. Zero pages. Mm, okay. 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 Uh, okay. Uh, Anybody got a razor? <laughs> yeah. The first seven books hurt you and hinder you if you don't accept the eighth because light not lived is darkness, darkness I'll pray our father in heaven thank you for these uh, these books this is uh, this is not easy rather than taking the ninth to the book we pray that the Lord would take the ninth to us help us to guard and believe and to yeah you know what I'm trying to say bless us help us have mercy on us ask it in Jesus name amen amen Oof.